verse, we already covered verse 1, about how Christ is our hope. Now look at verse 2, it says, Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Alright, so we've seen so far the basic definition of hope. We've seen the benefactor of hope, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we're looking at the beneficiary of hope. That is the recipient of the hope. So the benefactor is God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the benefactor. But the beneficiary, the recipient of that hope, is the child of God, the believer. Uh, the one who's been born again by grace through faith. And so what he says there, you see the beneficiary, unto Timothy, see? The hope that is in verse number 1, which is our hope, the hope that is in verse 1, is unto Timothy in verse 2. He, Timothy directly is the beneficiary of this hope. And uh, Timothy there represents all born-again children of God, all the sons of God. Uh, the body of Christ is what Timothy represents here. He says, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. Now, Timothy, biologically, was not Paul's son. You understand that, okay? Um, his daddy was a Greek, and uh, his, his mommy and his grandmommy were Jewish. Uh, Lois, meaning most beautiful, and uh, Eunice, and those were his uh, those were his um, his uh, Jewish uh, maternal uh, parents, you know, mother mother and grandmother. But his dad, his dad was a Greek. Uh, Paul is one hundred percent Jewish mm -hmm. of the tribe of Benjamin. Yeah. So Timothy is not Paul's son, but he does say unto Timothy, my own son. And notice in the faith, mm -hmm. see that. And that's because it can be assumed, it can be said that Paul led Timothy to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And not only did Paul lead Timothy to the Lord, but he took Timothy <laughs> under his wing and discipled him. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible says he would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Mm -hmm. So God's desire is for you to get saved, to get born again, mm -hmm. but not to stay just saved, but grow beyond that. Mm -hmm. Okay? Not that you're going to grow out of your salvation, understand you. But the Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians chapter 2 tells us. In other words, work out what is it. Okay? So you, as the son or, I'll be, you know, gender specific, daughter of God this morning. And I don't have a problem with that. First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, I think, says you're sons and daughters, you know. But uh, the child of God is a son of God by faith in the gospel. And, uh, and so if you are born again, if you are a child of God, then you have hope. You have received the hope that is in Christ Jesus, right? And, uh, and so he says, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. So let's go over to Colossians chapter 1. So Timothy represents you there, a child of God who's saved and hopefully grows a little bit in your salvation. Hopefully you don't just get saved and that's it. God never called any Christian just to become stagnant and stale. Yeah. Wouldn't you be a little worried about someone that never grew out of diapers? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now that happens, I understand. People get mental defects and they get issues, you know, physically or mentally that prevent them from growing up. But you would say that person does not represent the majority of individuals. And in fact, in some cases, you look at them a little differently, like there's something not right there. Right? Yeah. Yeah. If somebody is still in diapers and they're 30 years old, you think there's something not right there. Yeah. A man who's 40, 50 years old, hopefully there's nobody here this morning. Well, I better not go there. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. He's telling me, shut up. <laughs> but you get worried about somebody who never learns to grow up. And so the same thing for the child of God. God does not desire a a born-again child of God to just get saved and do nothing with their salvation. God expects there to be maturity in your Christian life. And if you haven't matured, then you know what you are? You're immature. You're a baby. You're immature. And uh, we got enough of immaturity running around amongst the lost. We don't need the saved to be immature also. Does that make sense? All right. Um, look at Colossians chapter 1. And maturity is not about how you dress. Yeah. Maturity is not about how many times you've read through the Bible. Maturity is not about how many gospel tracts you passed out and how many souls you led to Christ. That's not maturity. You can do all things and be as proud as a peacock. Yeah. Yeah. 
Maturity is about doing those things which is pleasing in God's sight, but doing it humbly. Amen. Doing it with a perfect heart, with a conscience, with faith unfeigned, as we saw Wednesday night. Remember what he says? Charity is the end of the commandment. Good conscience, pure heart, faith unfeigned. That's maturity. Amen. All the other stuff is just an outward appearance of hopefully what's taking place inside. Yeah. But it doesn't any more represent you being mature than a person who cleans up their life and never goes back to the old ways, but never puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah. Amen. You can clean. The Bible says you white it simple because you clean the outside, but inwardly you're full of dead man's bones. Right. Mm -hmm. That's not maturity. Yeah. That's just learning the lingo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's learning the dress code. Mm -hmm. That's learning the standard. Learn the fundamentals, mm -hmm. but it don't make you much of a Christian at all mm -hmm. in God's eyes, in Jesus Christ's own words in Matthew 25. All right, Colossians 1 27. He says, To whom Colossians 1 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Now here's the mystery. Yep. Which is Christ in you, what? See that? Now look. Look at verse 26. Look at verse 26. We'll get the context. Look at verse 26. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations. Look at that next two words. But now. See, something has changed in time. Old Testament, they didn't have the mysteries that you and I have. They were mysteries concealed. The, New, the Old Testament are mysteries concealed. The New Testament is mystery revealed. In the Old Testament, they didn't know about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, come to earth as a lame slain, as a lame slain for the for the sins of mankind. They knew nothing about that. They were looking forward to the cross. Yeah. Yeah. They were looking forward to the cross. Now you can go back and look at the Old Testament and see all of the Old Testament types and pictures and similes. And really get a nice understanding of what God was doing in the Old Testament. But put yourself back in the Old Testament. Put yourself back there in Abraham's day when he's fixing to pick up that knife and plunge it down into Isaac's heart. And say he was looking forward to the cross. He wasn't thinking about Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. Being betrayed at the hands of Jews. Being hung up on the old rugged cross. And resurrecting the third. He wasn't thinking. But you have a beautiful picture of it. Yeah. But that's not what Abraham was looking at. He was looking at his 13 to 17 year old son laying there like, uh, Daddy, what are you doing? Think about it. And Isaac was certainly not looking forward to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was looking forward to, I hope Daddy has a change of heart here. But you can look back at that. So the Old Testament is our mysteries concealed the New Testament are the mysteries revealed. Very simple way to look at it. Now, how about you? When you were lost, none of what I make what I'm saying right now makes any sense to you. As a lost person, there might be somebody here lost this morning, I don't know. None of this makes any sense to you. I mean, it's registering that there's a man speaking, he's got a Bible, I hope he's telling me the truth. But now, when God turns the lights on, that's when the Bible comes alive. That's when the Bible makes sense. Uh, when you're unsaved, you just read the Bible that said rules and historical facts, hopefully facts, and things passed down. And, but it don't make a whole lot of spiritual good sense to you inwardly. It's just a bunch of accumulation of facts, and you're hoping they got it all right. But you're not even sure about that because, after all, did man write it? Or did it come out of heaven on a parachute? <laughs> See, as an unsaved person, you're not sure. But when you get born again, when you get saved, when God moves in, when you are the beneficiary of God's grace, His saving grace, and the hope that is in Christ Jesus, but now these things that I'm saying to you make sense. Yeah, exactly. See? Yes. Yeah. Why? Because as, as an unsaved person, it's mysteries concealed. Yeah. When do mysteries become start to become revealed is when the New Testament, when Jesus Christ goes through the gospel, his death is brought that's when things become revealed. Right? Yes. And so what, how are you going to understand what I'm talking about this morning unless the mysteries are revealed to you? How do they get revealed to you? 
through Christ. Yeah. Not just Christ on a cross, because He's not on a cross anymore. That's right. Amen. We preach the cross, but what are we preaching about the cross? Not that He's still there. That's right. What we preach about the cross is that He's not there, He's risen. Amen. Not only is He not there, He's also not in a grave. Right. He's risen, see? And so, so in order for you to understand and to make sense of the hope that I've been teaching you about, you have to have Christ... Not on a cross, not in a tomb, but where? Look at verse 26. But now is made manifest. Look at to his saints. You're the beneficiary. If you're the saint this morning, you're the beneficiary. To whom God would what? Make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery. That is all the things contained within the mystery of Christ. All these things can be made known unto you. How? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. See, none of the Old Testament makes sense to you. Nobody can understand why would God allow... His chosen people, his chosen race, his chosen nation, the Jews, why would he allow them to go into villages and towns and cities and completely wipe it out from the oldest to the youngest? I'm talking about genocide. I'm talking about absolute wiping out. In fact, God kicked Saul off the throne because he refused to do what God told him to do. He spared the lives of animals and the king. Mm -hmm. And for that disobedience, God says, out you go. Yeah. I'll bring in a guy that can do it. And David comes in and David executes yeah. from the highest to the oldest to the youngest and the lowest. Now you can't make sense of that and the world will mock you for believing that and they'll call this Bible bloody slaughterhouse religion. And they will say you live under a cruel God, a taskmaster, a misogynist, a racist, a homophobe, a, all, a xenophobe, and all the kind of phobias you want to ascribe to God. They will lay all that at your doorstep because there's things in that Bible that scream that God is that way. Like God wiping out Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. 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 You think that was just grown up adults living in there? There were men, women, and children in that place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And God destroyed it to the very ashes and dust mm -hmm. that it is today. How does a loving God do that? You don't get it unless you get born again. Mm -hmm. And after you get born again, you're still struggling with it. Yeah. You're still like, I don't know how you do it, Lord. <laughs> yeah, you struggle with that kind of stuff. And the unsaved will make sure you struggle with it. Yeah. And the devil will make sure you will struggle with it. Yeah. And your flesh will make sure you struggle with it. And other denominations will make sure you struggle with it. And your spouse or your husband or your children will make you struggle with it. Yeah. Unless you've got something inside of you that can resist the forces of evil, that can resist the powers of evil, that can resist the voices of evil, and stand firm in the truth of the Word of God and not be ashamed or afraid of it. Amen. There's enough critics out there to destroy your faith. Yeah. <laughs> and there's only one that's going to maintain it. Amen. And that's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. That's it. Amen. So you have, you got to be thankful that God has given you light. God has given you understanding. God has given you um, His Son and the Holy Spirit to make sense of these things. And if they don't make sense to you now... They can make sense to you if you will trust them, if you will live by faith, walk by faith, read that Bible by faith, and mature a little bit. See, the immature baby Christian looks at that stuff and gets scared of it. Whereas the mature Christian can look at that stuff and not explain it away, but explain it in light of Scripture. Explain it in light of the New Testament. Explain in light of saying, well, did you ever consider what they were doing to the children in those towns? So you're looking at a cruel God that wiped them all out. But did you ever consider what were the parents doing with those children in the... Yeah. Oh, I don't know. What are they doing them to, doing to them today? Yeah. 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 You don't think you want God to come in and bring down the hammer of judgment upon this crooked nation? Mm -hmm. You do. <laughs> Some of y'all right now thinking about faces you would like to see God wipe out. Yeah. yeah. The unsaved does that as well. They got no problem if they were God doing it. Yeah. See, if you are God, 
then you can choose who lives and dies. Mm -hmm. But God has taken that responsibility, aren't you thankful, yeah. Yeah. out of your hands and is put into the hands of a holy and just God who sees and knows all things outwardly and inwardly. In other words, he knows what they are capable of. i got to get back on point. <laughs> the sons of God, Timothy, by representative, are the sons of the faith who have this hope inside them. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. Now, there's a lot of prophetical <coughs> undertones to this chapter, but let's just keep it simple and look at verse number 8. Now, notice the way that phrase, the sentence starts, but. Notice, in contrast to the verse prior, in contrast to them, who are them? Who are they? Those that are drunken, are drunk in the night. So in contrast to those who are drunk in the night, but let us, who are of the day, be sober. Now that's a great verse if you want to preach against, you know, alcoholism and all that stuff. But that's not the context that he's talking about here. Although you can use the world and how they conduct a lot their business at night versus how business is conducted during the day. And you can certainly draw the parallel that Paul was making. Consider the time in which he's writing. He's writing at a time where Rome is in charge and the city streets are not as safe as they are today. So this picture is a bunch of drunken sailors <laughs> in downtown, wherever they are, Thessalonica, where a bunch of paganism is going on and how they're carrying on themselves. Probably not too far off from what you see in Las Vegas, yeah. Or Chicago, or New York City, or Manchester, yeah. or Berlin in 1930. Listen up. Yeah. I don't know where you live, but I ain't seen nothing like like what he's describing here in my backyard. Yeah. I'm thankful for it, but let let the devil have his way, and he would turn Manchester. Although I did just see this morning, I think it was like six people arrested, like 42 like stab wounds or something like that, like a knife fight, like a, like a full-on Gangs of New York. Yes. Uh, like, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what's that movie West I'm thinking of? Huh? West Side Story. West Side, thank you. I don't know how you knew that. Yeah. Mom, mom, son. <laughs> Telepathy there. Like, like, yeah, like West Side Story. You know, like the Jets and the Sharks. You know, on. That's what we're going back to. If, if, you know, man could have it his way. So look, so he's saying, in contrast to that, but let us. Who's the us? It's those who are saved. It's those who have had the lights turned on. See that? But let us who are of the day be what? Sober. Sober. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love. And for a, hel for a helmet, what? The hope of salvation. Yeah, amen. So when you approach the Bible, when you approach Scripture, when you approach preaching, when you approach teaching, whether you're the one doing it or the one receiving it, you have to allow your mind to be sober. The problem is, is that most of us don't approach the throne of grace. Most of us don't approach the book or the church with sober minds. I'm not saying you're coming here half-cocked on whatever <laughs> liquor choice the world has. I'm saying your mind is bombarded with the things of this world all week that when you come into church, you're like a staggering man, a drunken man, staggering to and fro. You don't know up from down, left from right, good from evil, all that. You're trying to make it all sense, make sense. Mm -hmm. Like, Lord, just make it make sense. And that's what preaching's supposed to do. But you have to be saved, number one. You gotta have the lights turned on. But you also gotta approach it soberly, sober minded. That is, take the Bible at face value by faith. Put on the breastplate of faith and love. And then he says, for a helmet, that's the thing that goes on the head. Yep. Sober-minded. The hope of salvation. So there's that word hope there. Now, this is not a hope of salvation in like, I hope I'm saved. Right. Yeah. Right. 
there's a lot of religions out there that will tell you you can't know for sure you're going to heaven when you die. <coughs> and I'd say those religions are false. Amen. I'd say those are damnable heresies. Yep. To make your soul in jeopardy of where it's going when it dies is not sober. No. Right. If you're teetering and tottering and staggering on am I saved or not, that's not a sober approach to the Word of God. Because the Bible says that you may know that you have eternal life. So you have to be sober-minded with this helmet that is called the hope of salvation. So when we're talking about a hope of salvation, what kind of salvation are we talking about? It's not the salvation of my soul because that's already been taking place. Right? I've already got the blessed hope of salvation the moment that Christ moved in. So what is the helmet that goes on the mind that gives me a hope for a salvation? What's it talking about? It's talking about God saving you out of this world. That's what he's talking about. The hope of salvation that goes on the that goes on your head, the spiritual armor that you're wearing, the breastplate of faith and love, or he calls it the breastplate of righteousness in Ephesians 6, and the helmet of salvation, or the helmet of the hope of salvation. Is what keeps us sober-minded to say, okay, a little bit longer, a little bit longer. It won't be like this forever. God's going <laughs> to deliver me. God's going to give me the victory. God's going to put an end to it all. God's going to rapture us out of this world. God's going to save us. God is going to put down the enemy and is going to take out the righteous. God is in charge. God is in control. Why, why, why are seeing that days are hid from the Almighty? I, can I not see the things that are going on and make sense of them? I don't know why the things are the way they are in the world, but I know I have a God, yes. sober-minded. I know there's a God in heaven that sees and knows more than I see or know, and that while I don't understand it, there's still a God in heaven that sees and knows all things, and He is in charge. Amen. And so that helmet of the hope of salvation is me taking myself out of the picture and putting God in my place. He, if He is our hope, and He is our supposed to be our head, then what I've got to do is I've got to take my head off, put His head on, and put that helmet or that crown on His head to say, He is still King of kings and Lord of lords. I am not. He is in control. I am not. He sees and knows all things. I do not. He makes sense of it all. I cannot. And that's how you stay sober. Otherwise... You hate everything and everybody and everything's a conspiracy and everything's going wrong and everything is this and everything is that. And that's why we have to go through the tribulation. We've got to endure to the end. I can't take the mark of the beast. What is the mark of the beast? Is this the mark of the beast? And Christians are staggering on their faith. Like Proverbs talks about, a drunken man, like the mass of a sea, getting beaten up all night long in the bar... Going to bed at night, wake up the next morning and say, let's try that all over again. Yeah. And there's a lot of Christians that are that way. Yeah. They, they're, they're staggered on doctrine. Yeah. What's happening to the Christians that used to hold to the faith? Yes. They've removed the sound mind of God and replaced it with the feeble mind of man. Yeah. And have taken the crown of God and put his own crown on his own head declaring, I am God. Hello, Satan. Antichrist, I will sit, I will ascend, I will sit in the seat of the Most High. That's you this morning. If you, if you think you can figure it out and God's somehow lost control. Well, let me just say this. If God has lost control, what makes you think you can gain control? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. He's God. Listen, listen. A lot of folks that are struggling with things, they know there's a higher power there. And they will turn to a higher power because they know they tried things in their own power and it has failed. Now, I'm not saying just having a higher power means you're a Christian. That's right. It don't make you saved because you believe in a higher power. That's right. right. The Bible says the devils believe and tremble. Yeah. The devils believe in a higher power. In fact, the old adage is, are you smarter than a fifth grader? The devils are smarter than a lot of Christians. Yeah. 
Yes. Because a lot of Christians think that God has somehow lost control and the devils know he's in control oh, yeah. and they have no control unless he lets them do what they want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Enter Job. Yes. So we have to let God speak for himself. You can't speak for God and try to cover up for God and try to make excuses for God. Let God be true, but every man a liar. Yes, amen. See that thing there? Well, say, Pastor, that means you're a liar. Yeah, you're right. So you better check what the preacher says with the book. Amen. I'm not saying I'm infallible. I don't believe the guys that interpreted the old versions were infallible. Yeah. If you believe the King James translators were infallible, then that makes them God. Yeah. They were not infallible. Right. Y'all too quiet on that. But God is infallible. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. That means infallible God can use fallible men. Yeah. That's you. Yeah. Yeah. That's me. Yeah. The question is, do you want to be used? Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. So God has given us the Word of God. He's given us the Spirit of God. He's given us, sadly enough, common sense in light of Scripture <laughs> to say, okay, God is in control. And He is the hope of my salvation. Now again, this is not a hope of getting saved, but is a salvation of God removing us, taking out us, taking us out of the problem. Which is why in verse 9 you get, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to what? Obtain right. That does not mean that you're going to obtain salvation of your soul. In the sense that you're going to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. You're not going to obtain going to heaven because you're a good person. Or because God likes Brother Todd better than he likes Brother Dave. Mm -hmm. God don't pick and choose. This, this side over goes to heaven. This side over goes to hell. That's not how God operates. So the obtaining of the salvation here has nothing to do with whether or not you get born again. See, for God not appointed us to wrath. In other words, God is, it's not talking about whether or not God is going to put you in hell based on how much he, what he thinks of you and put you in heaven because of how much he thinks of you. All salvation is determined upon Jesus Christ and your faith in him. Yes, amen. Now that you're saved, God has not appointed any of the children of God, any of the sons of God, God has appointed no born again child of God to what to obtain to 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 uh, uh, go, to uh, be appointed to wrath. That's right. Praise the Now, what's the wrath talking about? Well, it can take. It can talk about two things. Number one, it can talk about hell. Yeah. In other words, now that you're saved, God cannot put you in His wrath of hell. <laughs> The hope of my salvation is I know whom I believe in and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which he has committed unto him against that day. So I know that I can't lose my salvation. That's my hope of salvation in that I cannot go to hell now that I'm saved. But that in the context is not what he's talking about. In the context, the wrath there that he's speaking of has to do with the tribulation. Because chapter 4 closes with the comforting words of the rapture. Mm -hmm. Then chapter 5 has to deal with those who are left behind and what they have to go through for the time of the end. Mm -hmm. And what he's saying is, hey, those that are drunk in the night, those that can't figure it out, those that don't know, that's on them. But those of you who should know better and do know better, hey, you've got a blessed hope coming one day. And it is based upon this blessed hope that I will not put you into my wrath of the tribulation period, the time of the end. God takes us out before ushering in that time period. Now that for me, folks, is as good as it gets. Because long before any sinner gets cast into hell, the lake of fire, that's alive after the rapture, they got to endure what the Bible has to talk about during those years. See? Why am I bringing this to your attention? Because hope has a whole lot more to do with this, just you getting saved. Amen. The beneficiary of hope, the, the benefits of hope, 
is more than just I'm not going to hell. And it's more than just God will deliver me out of my problems. Folks, the next big event on the calendar is the time of the end. The next big event that this world is up against is not who's going to be the next president. <laughs> it's not Russia and Ukraine. The next big event on God's prophetical calendar is the period called the time of the end. From the beginning of sorrows all the way out to the time of the great tribulation. Whatever those years are there, that's the next big event on God's prophetical time clock. And the hope of salvation that we have is that that does not start counting down until we go up. Yeah. <laughs> because what happens is, for the last 2,000 years, man has been stuck inside of a bubble. God's prophetical time clock is in a bubble of parentheses. When the clock starts counting down, that's, that's God counting down to the second advent. And then God puts down the Antichrist and he puts down the devil and all that kind of stuff there. Puts him in the lake of fire for a thousand years. And then God begins to wind the clock back up for a thousand years. And at the end of the thousand years, one more battle takes place. God then puts the devil in the lake of fire and he creates a whole new earth and all heaven and all that stuff. So the hope of salvation that you are supposed to have on your head this morning and not lose sight of it and not lose hope or faith. Notice it's called the breastplate of faith and love. It's faith and love in that God loved you enough to save you that he's not going to then make you endure all that time period. To then have to work out your salvation, to have to endure to the end, not take the mark of the beast. God's saying, no, you can have 100% complete salvation now. And, and, and when the time is up, the church age is over with, I'm taking you out. And anybody after you, what you had as a mystery revealed, now becomes a mystery concealed all over again. Right. See, Old Testament, mystery concealed. New Testament, mystery revealed. New Testament mystery revealed, guess what? Tribulational period, mystery concealed once more. They have no hope of eternal security. Right. A lot of that Bible shuts, closes to them. In other words, if you're in the tribulational period, I want you to think about this for a second. You think we got a hard now with all of Paul's 13, 14 letters there? Trying to make sense of it all? Imagine being in the period of the tribulation. And reading Paul. And trying to rightly divide. While you got locusts stinging you. Listen, you're just trying to stay awake to rightly divide. You're trying to get the church twice a week to rightly divide. Imagine being in the tribulation where the lights are turned out. Where you got scorpions and beasts and creatures coming out of the pit. You got asteroids falling in the sky. You got water turning to blood. Famines, pestilences. Marks of the beast coming out of the woodwork. You know, pestilences, diseases, walking zombies, and you're trying to rightly divide the word of truth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ain't that the craziest thing? Yeah. So what happens? All of what's revealed by Paul is concealed in the new in the tribulational period. Crazy stuff. You think you got it hard? Be thankful you ain't got to go over there. Yeah, amen. Do you know how crazy it would be? You know how crazy it would be for me to preach to you all the things I'm preaching to you now and then God usher in the tribulational period and now you're hearing a whole new doctrine about you got to endure to the end, Brother Todd? Yeah. About you can't know for sure? Well, what was my pastor preaching to me the last 10 years? Now all of a sudden I got Moses and Elijah preaching a whole new thing? I got angels preaching from the sky? In Galatians 1, it says, if an angel preaches something to you other than what I preach, let him be accursed. Well, wait a second, now the angel's preaching. and That's why God gives us the period that we're in, takes us out, and ushers in a whole new period. Folks, that's the hope of our salvation. Yeah. It's not that confusing unless you let it be confusing. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Now... Why do I say all this? Because go to Hebrews. I'm sorry, go back to 1 Timothy. 
This is something that just occurred to me this week. You know the old saying, has never occurred to you that nothing's occurred to God? Mm -hmm. That he that sits in the heavens shall laugh. God's laughing because something just occurred to me. And he's like, yeah, I've been seeing that since, you know, the beginning of time. But well, 1 Timothy chapter 1, so we've seen the basis, uh, the, the definition, the benefactor, the beneficiary. Now look at the basis of our hope. Verse 2, unto Timothy, my own son, in what? The faith. The faith. The basis for our hope is faith. Everything I just preached to you, you have to take by faith. Why? Because there are places in this Bible that would contradict what I just said to you. Everything I just said to you about not having to endure to the end and not take the mark of the beast and all that stuff, there are places in the Bible that go 100% against what I just preached. I'm not saying there aren't contradictions in the Bible. There are contradictions in the Bible. But that's because they're different doctrines for different periods for yeah. different people. Yeah. Yeah. So they contradict one another solely based on who is it being written to right. and what's, it be, what's being written about. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So what you have to do is for a second take everything I just said to you 30 minutes, 30 minutes and believe it by faith. Well, I don't want to do that. Well, how did you get saved? For by grace he is saved through faith. What somebody preached to you about a man who lived 33 and a half years, a perfect sinless life, and died a cruel death, never sinned, was laid in the tomb for three days and three nights, and miraculously was resurrected... You weren't there to see that. So how do you know what happened? There are people in that Bible that preached against the Lord Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. Hello, what did they do? He, what does Pilate say? Go and set a seal. And we'll pay you Jews to tell them that his body was stolen. And that's the record that's still believed today by most of the Jews as is recorded here. So there's a lot of things that contradict that, what we believe by faith. But now all of a sudden you can throw faith out the window because I'm telling you, you don't have to go through the tribulation. Nobody's ever been raptured out on a scale like we're going to go through. Yeah. Amen. Nobody's ever seen it happen on this wise. So yeah, it's something that nobody has experienced on that level before. And so it sounds like, wait a second, in the moment that twinkling of an eye, at the last trump of the trump shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And we shall be, that, That's going to happen? No way. Well, had anybody ever seen a man like Jesus before? Yeah. Die the way that he had died before? And be resurrected the way he was resurrected before? You don't think it was hard for them to believe it in that day? Of course it was. Yeah. So it's going to be hard for you to believe in a rapture before the tribulation. And I can give you all the references that prove it, but then somebody else can come along on TikTok or YouTube or Twitcher or Twitter and say, well, here's all the excuses and reasons why that guy's lying. Yeah. Yeah. And now guess what you got to do? you got to make a decision. Just like you did when you were lost. And somebody saying works for salvation and somebody saying faith for salvation. Amen. Somebody saying get baptized in a pool of water for salvation. Somebody saying no water required for salvation. You had to make a decision at some point in your life yes. by faith and faith alone. Yes. So why all of a sudden do we hit the rapture Pre-trip rapture, all of a sudden we're like, oh, that can't be. Why? Why? Well, there's contradictions. Yeah, there's lots of contradictions in the Bible. But somehow you've got past those to get the faith you need to get saved. I can show you places in the Bible where works are necessary for salvation. Faith and works. 
I can show you places where the Bible says, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, <laughs> you're not going to see the kingdom of heaven. Ain't nobody here that can qualify for that. So what do you do? And that's Jesus that said that. Yeah. Good. I only follow Jesus. Are you sure about that? You have to make a decision in your life. You're either going to believe it by faith or not. Because yeah. it's always a counter-argument. Yeah. The Bible says a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. Yes. God is going to give you all the truth you need, but He's going to counterbalance it with enough lies, enough untruth, or enough contradiction. So you have to say, it's one or the other, and I'm going to make a choice. Yeah. I'm just not going to choose to serve God. Well, not choosing is choosing. I'm only going to do it because they dragged me to. Or I'm forced to. Okay. You still got to make a choice. See that? And so eventually you have to grow up past the immaturity of prove it to I believe it by faith. Now one more and we'll be done. There's lots of donuts out back. I'll give you extra time this morning. <laughs> I mean, the Kerrigan family comes in and just blows us up with donuts and all those goody things. Praise God. I know why God brought y'all in here. It's just to keep us hopped up on the sugar. Praise God. I'll take more like it. And Brother Brad's been carrying the torch for about two years now. He's getting some help. All right, one verse. We'll be done. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things what? Hoped for the evidence of things not seen. not seen. Faith is the substance. You know what substance is? It's a substance. Substance. It's a stance that's made from underneath. I'm taking a stand from something beneath me. That's my foundation. I'm going to stand in my hope based upon my faith in the Word of God. It's a subs sub substantive thing. It's something that I can stand firmly on. And you, can, you know what? That will drive the scholars mad and the critics mad and the theologians mad. Because you're eventually just going to say, listen, I can argue with you all day long. But at the end of the day, I'm just going to take it by faith. They can't discredit that. Yeah. And that drives them mad. Yeah, yeah. How do you know you're going, going to heaven when you die? I believe it. Yes. I believe it. Yes. Well, the Bible is written by man. Still, I still believe it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, church, church and pastors are crooked and they're thieves and they're all bad. Still going. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> that drives them mad. Mm -hmm. So next week, I'm going to show you how this faith that is the substance of our hope is connected to the resurrection. Okay. Heavenly Father, pray, bless.